So before we go on, let's visit the weather a little bit and climate and then transition to saying what we have already been doing to cause climate change and even before climate change became such a controversial or such an important topic depending on where you stand. Uh, so this section is called a planet called weather. The notion of the global environment far from marketing human uh, marking sorry humanity's reintegration into the world signals a culmination of a process of separation. This is Tim Ingold in the book Globes and Spheres: The Topology of Environmentalism. So the critical philosophical question is are we part of the earth system part of planet and its weather and climate or are we somehow external agents so from the physics point of view it's often argued that we are becoming like an external forcing because we are removing fossil fuels from under the ground and burning it and putting co2 into the atmosphere causing radiation imbalances just like vol a volcano would do which we will see in the next section and just like orbital changes in the sun's uh, orbit or Earth's orbit around the sun would uh, do in terms of ice ages and so on um, and the increase in the CO2 in terms of parts per million which is now increasing every year by over four parts per million and the CO2 emissions in billions of tons which is increasing by about uh, 40 to 50 so here we are uh, uh, at uh, 35 billion tons since the uh, industrial revolution um, in terms of uh, uh, annual emissions in, in uh, weight so what is this doing? Obviously we have to go through the energy balance to uh, do that. Uh, I'm not going into the details here. It is done uh, in other podcasts, in other courses that you can look up, uh, including the details of the stratosphere, the circulation, and so on and so forth. But the book calls it the Trenbert Diagram. Essentially, it is focusing on how sun's energy is coming in, 341 watts per meter squared, and some of it is getting reflected by the atmosphere, aerosols, clouds, and so on. Some of it is being reflected by the surface, forest, deserts, snow, ice, etc. So in effect we reflect about 30% of it back to space and the remaining 70% uh, some of it is absorbed in the atmosphere, some of it is hit, hitting the surface and evaporating, warming land, doing lots of things and anything that has a temperature that's getting heated uh, begins to emit infrared radiation, long wave as we call it. Uh, so you can see that thermals are here at 17 uh, units, uh, evapotranspiration from vegetation uh, at 80 and that's going to release, be released at late, as latent heat flux in the atmosphere. Atmosphere is not transparent to this outgoing long wave because of the greenhouse gases like CO2, CFCs, HFCs, methane, N2O, ozone and so on. Uh, surface radiation is uh, at 396 uh, out of which 22 is going through the atmospheric window. It's a spectral band where uh, OLR can get out and 374 is uh, hitting the atmosphere and the atmosphere takes this energy, reaches some temperature and then begins to reflect energy back to Earth, so downwelling radiation of 333 here and then the outgoing 239 has to basically balance the difference of this incoming short wave and outgoing short wave, reflected short wave, right? So energy balance would require that the short wave and the long wave are balanced at some uh, time scale. And of course, greenhouse emissions are trapping more and more energy and increasing the surface temperature. So atmosphere obviously warms up and reflects at a different temperature and so on. Um, <coughs> Emissions of CO2 are monotonic as we saw here, but the increase in temperature is not monotonic because energy goes into the ocean, 90, more than 90% is absorbed by the ocean, it goes into melting glaciers and so on and so forth. So if you look at the uh, anomalies around the long term average, before about the 1940s the earth was colder than the base period. Uh, and after that it's had some ups and downs but it has been warming 
and there have been periods where the warming is a little flatter called the global warming hiatus or the global warming pause and so on during which actually the energy was still in the system it was being hidden into the ocean and uh, people have argued a lot about it but if you look at it as decades of warming then you will see more clearly that even though year to year there are ups and downs uh, each decade is been warmer than the one before so 2020 had for example the second warmest uh, temperature on record after 2016 so we continue to warm then the question is uh, how much energy is being trapped so this is the contribution of heating imbalance in watts per meter squared which continues to increase because of nitrous oxide CFC 11 and 12 uh, carbon dioxide is of course the biggest contributor and then comes methane and so on um, the question is how do we deal with these things uh, uh, as we already saw in the introduction we said uh, the emissions continue, negotiations continue, renewables continue, investments in renewable increase, renewables increases, but the narrative along the way has been that um, this is using such images uh, as the earth rise from 1968 taken over uh, f from Apollo 8 by uh, uh, astronaut Bill Anders to portray earth as a spaceship and to say that we are uh, within the spaceship hurtling around space and there is either going to be harmony and action together on earth in the spaceship or there is going to be mutiny and so on and so forth but depending on your philosophy you know that earth is going to be fine planet is not exploding it is a question of us are we able to survive and how many other species we take down with us right but in terms of geoengineering, philosophically speaking, if you look at studies by Bill Ruddiman and so on, this is looking at uh, time going backwards here, back to about uh, uh, 9,000 years before present. The temperatures are warmer in the Holocene. We were coming out of the Ice Age. And the uh, cooling that is happening over 50 million years should have continued so the July solar radiation and natural greenhouse gas trends should have given us a continued colder temperatures but because of greenhouse gas emissions from humans we have actually changed the climate this way in Northeast Canada so we are above now the threshold required for glaciation so if you look at past glaciations which you can see in my other courses Ice ages last about a hundred thousand years and interglacials or the melting phase, melted phase of ice age last only for about 10,000 years and Holocene already is over uh, 12,000 years or so, right? So we have already done some geoengineering in that sense and our activities since the end of the last ice age 20,000 years ago, we are in the interglacial warmth uh, we come out of the glacial cold we have had a hiccup called the younger dryas here which you can see uh, in other podcasts the natural trend should have taken us here bringing us to towards uh, the next ice age but we are well above the glacial threshold and looks like we may be uh, turning off the next ice age for a long time right so in that sense we have already done our geoengineering for a while the other context you can use is to say that global warming has happened it has had negative impacts it will continue to have negative impacts but in the context of geoengineering is geoengineering an option or not uh, in this case the idea is that the emissions are mostly from the rich people and the poor countries like India, China, African countries, South American countries remained the most vulnerable whereas the countries that got rich by emitting all these carbon remain least vulnerable to climate impacts. I hope you're hearing the thunder, this beautiful thunder happening. Um, so does that mean that we can rich people will be protected better by climate imp from climate impacts by technology and by infrastructure and uh, by their ability to protect themselves against air quality water quality diseases and so on and so forth even though covid has exposed all kinds of issues um so this is the uh, 
To conclude, richest people, top, richest 10% are responsible for almost half of the total lifestyle consumptions, whereas the poorest 50% are responsible, are responsible for only about 10% of the total lifetime uh, consumption. Okay, so the other thing to worry about is that the uh, idea of being put out like the safe operating space uh, in terms of planetary boundaries uh, by various groups led by Stockholm Group and Rockstrom and so on um, essentially says if we sh go back to the pre-industrial time then we have safe operating space and then we are exceeding the thresholds in many of these like biosphere, land, u land system change, freshwater use, biogeochemical flows and so on and so forth and these ideas are then uh, used to try to propose policies. Is this a good idea? Does this provide an uh, equitable, just solution? Or is this going to just uh, get us uh, away from being uh, equal, just, and uh, develop uh, everybody having a good uh, uh, standard of living? Okay, so for that we will need the concept of Earth system where we are part of the system and we are not outside, we are part of the biosphere. So if you remember Archimedes said, uh, give me a place to stand and give me long enough lever and I'll move Earth. Well, we are trying to move Earth but there is no other place to stand. We have to act within the Earth system and remember that energy received from the Sun is about 170,000 terawatts we reflect about 50 of it because of albedo reflectivity and the remaining 120,000 terawatts is many times larger, more, almost 10 times larger than the world energy use right now of 15 terawatts. So can we find solutions? Okay, so that's the argument that not only is geoengineering part of the solution but we actually have already been doing geoengineering unintentionally. Now we are saying we want to maintain some safe operating space and see geoengineering as Frankenstein experiments. US just a few months ago had ideas of trying solar radiation management or stratospheric uh, aerosol introduction to reflect sunlight. Lots of controversy, I think the idea has been dropped. So this be remains controversial. Some people will be arguing forever that geoengineering should not be tried. The question is, can we remain in a safe warming target by 2100 with any realistic probability if we don't consider geoengineering? That's the key question. Okay?